Golden State Media Concepts bring you Book Review Podcast, a haven for bookworms of all ages and the widest genres from mystery to memoirs, romance to comedy, fantasy to sci-fi. If you love to read, this is the podcast for you. It's the Golden State Media Concepts Book Review Podcast. Welcome to the GSMC Book Review Podcast, brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. I am your host, Sarah, and it is day one of the mandatory shelter-in-place, stay-the-heck-home, whatever you want to call it, order in the state of California. And I'm not entirely sure that I'm so good at working from home. I am i don't know. I mean, I'm a massive introvert, as you know, so working from home should be great. And I know I got a ton of stuff done today, but it just feels like I got nothing done today. I don't know. We'll see how it goes for from here on out. I mean, I flatten the curve. I, I'm totally on board with that. And I, as an introvert, I, I don't mind staying home. Just not sure that... I have this, I have the, the system down yet for working from home. At any rate, I, I do know how to do podcasts from home and to work on those. I, I can do that. And, um, thankfully, as I said in the last episode, podcasts can be done, interviews can be done with the appropriate amount of social distancing. So. I am happy that today I have a long overdue interview to share with you. I originally spoke with Andrew Marinus um, in February, I think it was February 10th or so, and we had a lovely conversation. And then I went to um, post the episode, edit the episode, and it turns out that it didn't record. Yeah, really not really so sure what happened there. You can bet I double checked about 84,000 times during our conversation today. But uh, thankfully, he was patient uh, and um, understanding and he was willing to reschedule. Then, of course, there was a tornado in Nashville and then the coronavirus. And I don't know, it's just all kinds of craziness. So we finally were able to reschedule for today. And I am very appreciative that we were able to and that we were able to um, get this this interview recorded and I can share it with you. So as I said, the author that I'm interviewing today is Andrew Marinus and he has he writes historical non-fiction he writes uh, his first book was called Strong Enough and his second book the one that we're speaking about today is called Games of Deception let me get make sure that I get the um subtitle correct so it's called Games of Deception the true story of the first US Olympic basketball team at the 1936 Olympics in Hitler's Germany it is uh f- written for young adults and here is the description on a scorching hot day in July 1936 thousands of people cheered as the US Olympic teams boarded the SS Manhattan bound for Berlin Among the athletes were the 14 players representing the first-ever U.S. Olympic basketball team. As thousands of supporters waved American flags on the docks, it was easy to miss the one courageous man holding a boycott Nazi Germany sign. But it was too late for a boycott now. The ship had already left the harbor. 1936 was a turbulent time in world history. Adolf Hitler had gained power in Germany three years earlier. Jewish people and political opponents of the Nazis were the targets of vicious mistreatment, yet were unaware of the horrors that awaited them in the coming years. But the the Olympians on board the SS Manhattan and other international visitors wouldn't see any signs of trouble in Berlin. Streets were swept, storefronts were painted, and every German citizen greeted them with a smile. Like a movie set, it was all just a facade, meant to distract from the terrible things happening behind the scenes. 
This is the incredible true story of basketball from its invention by James Naismith in Springfield, Massachusetts in 1891 to the sport's Olympic debut in Berlin and the eclectic mix of people, events, and propaganda on both sides of the Atlantic that made it all possible. The book includes photos throughout a who's who of the 1936 Olympics, bibliography, and index. This book is so well done. I thoroughly enjoyed it. Uh, it is, as I said, written for young adults, but that obviously doesn't mean that, you know, adults can't read it. Of course we can read it. I'm all, I'm all the time reading stuff for, for young adults, but this just means that it's, um, it's a quick read. It's engaging and it, uh, it, it in no way condescends or talks down in terms of the subject matter, but it's just, it's written in a way that is, uh, maybe more engaging for a younger audience. But that does, that, that just, I think means it's also more engaging for, um, a not as younger audience. And really, what is age? We're all as old as we feel, right? So this is so well done and it, touches on so many important historical, um, social, cultural events, um, circumstances, what have you. And unfortunately, there's so many things that are talked about in this book that are still timely, that are still um, concerns for today. There's a lot of parallels between this book and what is going on in the world today. So just really well done and I very much recommend it especially if you have um, someone in your family who is interested in history or you're trying to get them interested in history you know you can kind of use that sports angle maybe if they're a sports fan and and sneak a little history into their their reading habits at any rate let's go ahead and turn to the interview with andrew so he can talk more about the book again it is called games of deception and let's turn now to that interview hi andrew welcome to the podcast hey sarah thanks for having me on actually i should say welcome back to the podcast because we tried doing this a while ago, and um, there were technical difficulties, so thank you for coming back to speak to me about um, your new book. Before we get to the book, though, if you could um, start by sharing a little bit about yourself, that would be great. Okay. Well, it's my pleasure to be back on. Uh, hopefully, I'll remember anything interesting I said last time. <laughs> um, <laughs> I live in uh, Nashville, Tennessee, and uh, been uh, holed up here with my family the last several days due to uh, coronavirus, but I have a wife and two kids, nine and six. Uh, I work at Vanderbilt University in the athletic department there as a visiting author, which is a a great title. I don't think that too many athletic departments have that, but the reason that came about is my first book was a book called Strong Inside, which was a biography of Perry Wallace, who uh, was the first African American basketball player in the SEC, and he had gone to Vanderbilt in the late 60s, which is also the school that I went to um, in the 1980s and, and 90s. Um, after having grown up in Wisconsin and Washington D.C. and in Austin, Texas, um, so I live in Nashville. I, I don't uh, sing or play music or anything like that, but I'm here in in Music City and uh, writing books and working uh, by day in an athletic department, which I really enjoy. Uh, that, that's very cool. I, I don't know that I've ever heard of, you know, the, 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 uh, an author in uh, the athletic, in an athletic department like that. So that's very cool. Yeah, I've never heard of it either. Um, we, the former athletic director, David Williams was an avid reader and really into history and especially into uh, uh, U.S. civil rights history. And so he was, um, a mentor and a supporter of my book. And after it came out, um, Strong Inside was required to be read by every freshman at Vanderbilt for two years in a row, kind of learned this history oh, wow. of their school. And uh, we started something called the Sports and Society Initiative, which studies issues related to race, gender, and sports. And so I've helped um, launch and um, manage that program. Very cool. 
so speaking of sports and history, um, that <laughs> that's a, an excellent segue in, into your new book, which is called Games of Deception. Can you give an overview of the story? Sure. Games of Deception uh, is sports nonfiction again. It's the true story of the first U.S. Olympic basketball team, which played at the 1936 Olympics in Nazi Germany. Um, this book really has three main threads to it, I would say. The first is um, uh, the invention of the game uh, of basketball itself by James Naismith in 1891. And, you know, who was this man and why did he invent basketball? How did the sport grow internationally um, within just 45 years and during his lifetime that he could invent the game and then see it played in the Olympics. Um, the second is how was this first team put together? Uh, who were the members of the first U.S. Dream Team? Uh, and what were their backstories? And, and then the third and most important aspect of the book is what was the world like at this time? What was it like to be an athlete uh, in Berlin, in Nazi Germany in 1936. Uh, what was the state of politics um, in the U.S. and in Germany during this pre-war period? And what are the lessons that we can learn from it today? Let's go ahead and take our first break of the podcast. When we come back, we'll be talking more about the origins of basketball, something that I didn't have a clue about, frankly, before I read this book. So I got to learn something new and very interesting. So stay tuned. You're listening to the GSMC Book Review Podcast, and I'll be right back. Are you tired of the same old news? Are you sick of the seemingly endless political spin and negativity? The GSMC America Still Beautiful podcast is a weekly news podcast covering all the top positive and uplifting news stories. We cover stories that will inspire, uplift, and remind you of the good in the world. Tune into the Golden State Media Concepts America Still Beautiful podcast to get all the great and positive news stories of today. Download the GSMC America Still Beautiful podcast on iTunes. Stitcher, SoundCloud, Google Play, or anywhere you find podcasts. Just type GSMC in the search bar. Welcome back to the GSMC Book Review Podcast. I am speaking with Andrew Marinus about his uh, historical book, Games of Deception. And before the break, he was talking about some of the parallels that uh, occur between the books, the book and now, and just an overview of that book. Um, so when we pick back up, I am agreeing with what he had just said. Uh, there was no great place to make that uh, cut, so I just left it as it is. But you are all my brilliant listeners, and I know you'll figure it out. So let's get back to the interview. Yeah, there's a lot um, of very interesting aspects of the book. Uh, I was really intrigued because I realized as I was reading the beginning of the book that I had no idea why we have basketball in the world. And um, it really came about because of kind of a challenge of here, create something. <laughs> we need a sport. And so he did. Yeah. I really enjoyed doing that research. I went up to Springfield, Massachusetts, where um, James Naismith was a student at the International YMCA Training School. And it was essentially a graduate school that, that trained um, uh, at that time just young men to go out around the world and run YMCAs. And uh, this was a school with students from all over the world, and they would play baseball in the spring, and they would play football in the fall, but they really had nothing to do in the winter. They had a gymnasium, but obviously this was a world without basketball. And uh, so they would they would march or they would stretch. They played leapfrog. Uh, and these were guys in their 20s. They were they were bored. And so um, one of their professors challenged a class and said, you know, someone's got to come up with a new game to keep us busy in the winter and that w and we can share this game with, with wise around the world. And so uh, one student raised his hand to accept this challenge. It was Naismith. He had two weeks to come up with uh, an invention of a new game. And, and like most students, he waited until the night before his assignment was due and that was the night that he came up with uh, the game of basketball in his head. Um, 
the, the, the pieces of paper where the, the rules were first typed out still exist. And I, and seeing those pa pieces of paper is what gave me the idea for this book. They're now under glass uh, at the University of Kansas um, in the place called the DeBruce Center, which is next to Allen Fieldhouse, where Kansas Jayhawks play ba basketball today. Um, so anyway, Naismith in invented the game at, at this night, and the next morning he took his uh, fellow classmates onto the court. The custodian at the school nailed up uh, the peach baskets on the wall, that's why it's called basketball, they shot into peach baskets. And the reason why every hoop today is, is 10 feet off the ground is, is only because that custodian happened to nail the peach basket 10 feet off the ground in that first basketball game. And that was because there was an elevated running track uh, above the, the floor in this gymnasium, and that was 10 feet off the ground. Uh, and so those were the beginnings of this amazing international sport that we all know and love you know it was in, in one school and one gymnasium uh, in massachusetts in 1891 it was when it was first played yeah and it's amazing because it was first played in massachusetts but there were a lot of international students there who then took it back to their home countries and so it spread a lot quicker than you might have expected which is why it ended up at the olympics um in 1936 so, exactly. And um, it, yeah. So when you think about how how could a game just played at one school spread when there's no uh, I talk a lot to kids today about the book, you know, no technology. How did the word spread? And it was it was through people that graduated from the school, took the sport back with them to their countries. Also, the school had a newsletter that they mailed out to wise all over the world and they printed the rules in this newsletter. And that's how just within couple of years this game really spread quickly uh, all around the world and of course basketball is a fun game so people enjoyed playing it and it became very popular very quickly yeah so let's talk about then the the next aspect of the story which is the first olympic basketball team um why is this particular basketball team important in the history of not only basketball but also in the context of world war ii Sure. Um, well, they're important in the history of basketball simply because they were the first. Um, and I'll share a little bit about that. And in, in telling that story, um, the, the more important historical context comes into play. So what they decided to do that year um, was, you know, today the, the tryouts for an Olympic team would be like they would be at any school or any other type of team where individuals would try out and a coach would, would pick the best players to be on the team what they decided to do back then w was different it was to have a tournament and the best amateur teams in the country were invited to participate in this tournament uh, at that time the best amateur teams weren't just college teams but also um, teams from ymcas and aau teams uh, now aau would be high school players back then it was college graduates and there was no NBA, so what the best players would do is play for company teams. Um, and these were sponsored by the AAU. Um, and I should say that this tournament wasn't open to all players. It was only open to the best white teams in the country. So one aspect of my book is discussing segregation in the United States and how that compared to anti-Semitism in Germany at the time. So the best African-American teams in the country weren't eligible to try out for this tournament there also wasn't women's basketball in the 36 olympics that didn't come along till the 1976 olympics you know 40 years later um so this tournament was played and the eight, top eight teams met um at madison square garden in new york city and the idea was whichever two teams advanced to the championship game their entire rosters would be combined to become one u.s olympic basketball team uh, the two teams that made it to the championship, one was from McPherson, Kansas. These guys worked at an oil refinery, the Globe Refinery in McPherson. There was one significant player on that team. His name is Joe Fortenberry, and he's considered the first player ever to dunk the basketball in a game. Uh, he did it in one of those games uh, in New York, and a sports writer from the New York Times uh, saw this and it was unusual. No one had ever seen a dunk before. And so he had to come up with a way to describe what this looked like to his readers. 
and the words that he used was he said it looked like a, a cafeteria customer dunking their donut in coffee and that's where the term dunk comes from from this guy joe fortenberry from mcpherson kansas um the other half of the team the team that they met in the championship of the qualifying tournament came from very different circumstances they came from hollywood and these players worked at universal studios or universal pictures in hollywood they worked on the sets uh, of movies and they had a significant player on their team his name was sam balter and the reason why he he matters is he was jewish and so when their team won the qualifying tournament and qualified to go to berlin a reporter asked him are you go are you going to go and that was a significant question you know he had to decide whether he would participate in an olympics in nazi germany and sam balter made the decision to go he felt like based on what he knew at that time the best thing he could do would be to go to berlin uh, to perform well, to win a gold medal, and that would be the way that you would refute uh, Hitler. And Jesse Owens, as an African American, really has sort of had the same question. There are people arguing and trying to persuade him not to go to the Olympics. And they said racism anywhere is racism everywhere, and you can't do this. Um, but again, he decided the best thing he could do would be to uh, go to Berlin and win gold medals, and he won four of them. Um, I mean, by far was the star of those Olympics. But, you know, one point I make in the book is that, yes, Balter and Owens um, performed well and and certainly refuted uh, these notions of, of Aryan supremacy, but beyond the sports aspect, it's it's difficult to say that it it, it mattered. You know, it didn't, the uh, Olympics and their performance in the Olympics didn't um, stop the Holocaust. It didn't slow Hitler down at all. Um, and even when these men returned to the United States, Sam Balter lost his job for participating in the Olympics. Jesse Owens um, couldn't find work, was reduced to racing against horses as a way to make a buck. Um, and certainly he inspired um, African-Americans who participated in the civil rights movement to come. But it's, it's a complicated question to say whether um, their elite performance at the Olympics uh, accomplished much. Let's go ahead and take our second break of the podcast. Uh, as we go to break, I want to share my six degrees of separation story with Jesse Owens. It turns out that um, when my hubby was a small boy, he and his mom were in an airport. I don't know where they were traveling, but they were at an airport and a man came up and was speaking with them. And um, being a small boy and being kind of bored, my husband ended up falling asleep and the man was very kind and covered him up with his, uh, I think he said it was a fur coat. Uh, it's, it turns out that that man was Jesse Owens. And so my, somewhere in my in-law's house in Ohio, there is a picture of my hubby as a small child and he was adorable as a kid uh, sleeping under Jesse Owens' coat. Is Jesse Owens in the picture? I, wow, I don't remember. That's crazy. I'm going to have to double check. Uh, I'll get back to you on that. But how cool is that? Obviously, I have never met him, but, you know, I have that, that, that connection somewhere in the past through my husband. <laughs> so um, enough about me and my adorable hubby. Let's go ahead and take another break. And when we come back, we'll be continuing the interview with Andrew. So stay tuned. Oh, by the way, my husband's name, first name happens to be Andrew. So there you go. More connections. Let's take that break. <laughs> stay tuned. You're listening to the GSMC Book Review Podcast, and I will be right back. Tired of searching the vast jungle of podcasts? Now listen close and hear this out. There's a podcast network that covers just about everything that you've been searching. Hey! The Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network is here. Nothing less than a podcast bliss with endless hours of podcast coverage. From news, sports, music, fashion, cooking, entertainment, fantasy, football, and so much more. So stop lurking around and go straight out to the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. Guaranteed to fill that podcast itch. Whatever it may be, visit us at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter and download us on iTunes, SoundCloud, and Google Play.
Welcome back to the GSMC Book Review Podcast. I am speaking today with Andrew Marinus about his most recent book. It's called Games of Deception. Let's get back to that interview. Right. Yeah, there's there's so many different aspects. I mean, we could have a, a very long conversation just on the 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 Olympics, um, n- not only the basketball team, but but the Olympics as a whole and the, the stories right. of Jewish athletes who were there and some of them then didn't get to participate for, you know, various reasons, but really underlying anti-Semitism. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I mean, it's and you said something about racism here is racism everywhere, which, <laughs> yeah, well, he didn't, Jesse Owens didn't face much better situation here at the time. Yeah, exactly. Um, Exactly. So, a lot of the black athletes said they were treated better in Germany um, during the Olympics than they were in the United States. So, um, right. yeah, it's a major aspect of the book. Yeah, which is uh, just, it's 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 sad to know. Um, how much research did you do for the book? Well, quite a bit. I think that research is the most important part of writing nonfiction. You know, every single sentence has to come from some research that you've done. Um, with Strong Inside, I spent eight years on the book, uh, four years of research and four years of writing. That was my first book, so I didn't have an agent or a publisher waiting on it, you know, so I, I could afford to spend that much time. With this book, um, I just had a year, and so I spent about six months on the research, traveling to um, important uh, archives around the United States and Canada, um, and then I spent another six months um, writing the book. So quicker um, pace uh, with this book. And um, one thing that made that possible was that in this case, all the key um, players in the story um, have passed away. And so it wasn't a book that was based on as many interviews. I probably only interviewed about 15 people for this book. I'd talked to close to 100 um, for my book on, on Perry Wallace. And so it's time consuming to find people, to set up interviews, to travel, to visit them. And so with this one, I had five or six key archives to visit, uh, maybe 10 or 20 books to read, um, read through a lot of old newspaper articles from the 1930s, um, and was able to find the, the sons and daughters of many of the Olympians, and those were the people that I had my most productive interviews with, as well as a man um, named Dr. Al Miller, who's now 97 years old, uh, who attended those Olympics as a 13-year-old Jewish kid living in Berlin. And it was really a fascinating, enjoyable experience for me to um, talk to Dr. Miller. As a, he appears in the book as a character, both in the 1930s and then again at the very end of the book uh, in, in present day. Yeah, I love his story. I would actually, um, I, I would I would read a book just on his story, but, you know, I'll speak yeah. to students about his experience. I do. And so Dr. Miller, uh, as I mentioned, he, in in 36, he was a 13-year-old kid um, living in Berlin, seeing the world change before his eyes. You know, friends that are kids that had been his friends at school, all of a sudden they're turning on him uh, because he's Jewish. They're bullying him. They're joining the Hitler youth and marching in front of his house, singing songs about how they'll beat up and kill uh, Jewish people. And he's sort of scared and fascinated by this at the same time. Um he rides his bike to the Olympic Stadium. He says the first African-American person he ever saw in his life was Jesse Owens winning one of his gold medals. Um, but the next year, his parents, um, you know, can kind of sense and feel what what's, what might be to come. And they're worried about uh, the safety of their son and, and of themselves. And so they send Al at age 14 to the United States uh, by himself. Uh, he's not sure if he'll ever see his parents again. Uh, meanwhile, his mom is searching for fake passports to get herself and, and her husband, Al's dad, out of the country, while Al's dad goes to the hospital and has two unnecessary surgeries, two unnecessary appendectomies, just as an excuse to be hiding in the hospital while the Nazis are looking for him at his house. And thanks to some doctors pr- who protect him at the hospital, he's able to stay there for a month until his wife is finally able to find the um, fake passports and they're able to get out of the country and reunite with their son. Um, A few years later, Dr. Miller is old enough to enlist in the Army, in the U.S. Army during World War II, and because he speaks German, he's really valuable and he's used uh, to interrogate 
Nazi prisoners. Uh, and then today, as I mentioned in the book, he's uh, 97. He still visits schools in Cincinnati twice a month telling his personal story, but also the larger story of the Holocaust. And he says, you know, he was a witness to history. And as a witness, he has an obligation and a responsibility to talk about it. And I asked him, well, what do you tell kids? So uh, when they ask you, how do we make sure nothing like this ever happens again? And he says the kids uh, in school typically already know the answer. He tells them they've already said the answer out loud that morning uh, with their hand over their heart when they recited the Pledge of Allegiance. And he said the most important thing to remember is the last five words of the pledge, which are liberty and justice for all, uh, and not to forget the all part and uh, the for all part. And when we've seen what's happened um, throughout history uh, in Europe and the United States, all over the world, when people forget or intentionally leave out uh, the for all part and say that that certain freedoms and rights are only for some people and other people are inherently unworthy uh, of those freedoms. Uh, and so he's here as a witness to the Holocaust to, to remind us that. And I think it's a really important lesson and it's the message that I leave uh, readers of the book with in the final pages. Let's take another break. Uh, so stay tuned. You're listening to the GSMC Book Review Podcast and I will be right back. Pets bring such joy to our lives, and the GSMC Pets Podcast is here to share in that joy. We'll tell stories of pets finding their forever homes, acting in unexpected ways, being helpful, or just being silly. Whether you love dogs, cats, llamas, reptiles, fish, or you've never met an animal you didn't like, the GSMC Pets Podcast is for you. Welcome back to the GSMC Book Review Podcast. Let's go ahead and get back to the interview. You wrote the book. It's it's written for young adults. Um, and so it's, I, I really appreciate that it's written for young adults. It's, a, it's, um, it's very engaging. It deals with, you know, some very difficult topics of, uh, you know, racism here in the U.S., of the Holocaust, of horrible things in history, but really important things. And you write it in such a way that's very um, engaging and easy to read, and, and you, you, you address these issues so that they can be understood. And, you know, we're still facing a lot of these same issues today, so... What has been the reaction from um, the young adults who have read the book? Um, are they, you know, do they read it because of the basketball and then find out history or, or how, how are they reacting? Right. Uh, it's been really enjoyable. I, I love visiting schools. I, before um, the world's been shut down here over the last week or so, um, I've visited a lot of schools already um, with this book. I, I've been to 26 states between this book and my previous one, Strong Inside. Um, and uh, it, I, maybe you need to ask them. I feel like the kids like it a lot. Um, I think part of the reason why I write sports uh, or, or sports related books is because I think sports are accessible, you know? And so um, most people, whether they like sports or not, are familiar with them, you know, and, and it doesn't seem intimidating to read a book about a uh, U.S. basketball team, you know, uh, in the Olympics that could appeal to a wide range of people. And then once they get into it, uh, the story is, is broader than just the basketball. It's not just about, you know, how games turned out, but the state of the world at that time. And I try to write in a way that is not, you know, lecturing kids or is not um, uh, boring history. I was a history major in college. I love history. Um, and so I think the best way to write it is through stories of people, you know, and not just uh, facts and figures and dates to, to memorize or something like that, but to to write about what it felt to be Al Miller, a 13 year old kid living in Berlin at the time of the Olympics, or what it felt like to be one of the basketball players there, what it was like, even the fun parts, you know, riding the boat from New York to Germany. And I I printed the menu (laughs) in the book so that young people could see what did people eat in the 1930s. And I think that's what makes 
history come alive is to write about people and their stories. And that's so um, something we can all relate to. I think that teachers um, are interested and librarians are interested in the book um, for a couple of reasons. One, typically schools have a, a subset of kids that are really into sports or maybe really into video games, but they're not reading books yet. And a lot of times a sports uh, cover will attract those kids. And then, um, you know, studying the Holocaust is something that kids do in school. And so this book is another way um, to approach that subject. And I think that because it deals with the years before World War II, it's a little bit different than a lot of other books dealing with that time period. And, and that's where I think the most important um, lessons and the most important connections to today's world can be drawn from, you know, unfortunately. Um, what, what what was the world like during these early days of, of fascism? What was the world like during days of segregation and racism? And unfortunately, there's too many parallels um, to today, but it's what makes it a relevant book. And um, that's why I'm excited to have an opportunity to talk about it um, with young people. And at the same time, I'll say, and I think you have felt this way when we talked the first time, it's a book for young adults, but it's a book for adults too. Um, a lot of the readers have been adults it's just a little shorter than um you know a typical adult book with fast paced uh chapters um trying to keep the reader motivated to continue turning the page um but uh, I, I don't think that any adult would feel like they're reading a, a kids book when they're reading it um it's just it's basically the difference is it's shorter Absolutely. And I um, I also was a history major in college, and I completely agree. The, the books and the, the texts that drew me in the most were the ones that were, you know, that were social history, that were the specific stories of people during those times, rather than, you know, just dates and battles and politics, you know, stuff like that. So um, right. it's definitely a lot more engaging that way. Yeah, um, I completely agree. And um, thanks for saying so. Yeah, you're welcome. What are you working on now? Well, one, um, I guess, unintended or good consequence of staying home uh, with the coronavirus, uh, not that I have it, but this staying home is um, having a chance to finish my next manuscript, you know, which is um, a story called Singled Out. Uh, it's a biography of a man named uh, Glenn Burke who was the first openly gay major league baseball player. He played for the Dodgers and the A's in the late seventies. Um, I'm in the editing phase of that book right now. I've, I think the first time we spoke, uh, I was maybe a few chapters away from finishing. Now I've written all the, the chapters. I'm, I'm gathering photographs for the book, making a final round of edits. This book is scheduled to come out next March. So about a year from now, um, publishing industry is, is being hit like every other industry right now. And so I'm not sure how uh, things might change if they do at all with this book. But um, hopefully about a year from now, people will be able to read the story of Glenn Burke, who was a fascinating uh, person. He grew up in Oakland and Berkeley. Um, as I mentioned, played for the Dodgers in the A's. He uh, was run out of baseball um, because of his sexuality, uh, became a softball star um, in San Francisco in the Castro district in the early 80s um, but then you know that that area uh, in the country affected by the by AIDS and, and Glenn Burke died of AIDS in the in the mid 90s um, so it's a story with a tragic ending but um, an important figure in the history of, of sports that most people um, don't know uh, and so I'm excited to bring his story to the world yeah, I I had not heard of him, so I'm I'm intrigued. I mean, it's definitely a time in history when not many people at all were coming out as gay, let alone athletes. So he was um, incredibly courageous in that way. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I think one thing I, when I've been to schools talking about games of deception, and students will ask me, "What are you working on next?" And then I bring up this story, you know, to middle schoolers. Um, you know, they don't they don't miss a beat. Uh, I think when I was in middle school, if an author had said they were working on a book on a gay baseball player, I think a lot of the boys in the room would have laughed or snickered or something like that. And I've been really encouraged that that has not been the case at all in any of the schools that I've been to. Um, and so I'm really excited to see how 
how middle schoolers, high school students will react to this book. Yeah, I'm intrigued as well. You mentioned um, your first book, Strong Inside, and a little bit about that story. You also have, um, uh, am I remembering correctly, a graphic novel of that book as well? Uh, a young reader's edition. It, it's not a graphic novel. A young novel, reader. There we go. I do have a young reader's edition. Yes. So I initially wrote the book for adults, um, and that book came out in the end of 2014. And then um, some of your listeners may be familiar with the author of historical fiction named Ruta Sepetis. Uh Ruta lives here in Nashville, and she's a mentor of mine. She wrote books called Between Shades of Grey, Assault to the Sea. Her new book is Fountains of Silence. Um, and she suggested that I adapt Strong Inside for um, young readers. And thanks to her advice, uh, I did. <laughs> and so um, that book um, has been really enjoyable for me to tell that story. I first wrote about Perry when I was a student in college myself and came back to it 17 years later um, to write the initial adult biography. But I've, I've loved visiting schools telling the story of of American civil rights uh, through the lens of a college basketball player. Um, and again, I think it, it can, it's a way to talk about history um, through sports in what I think is a compelling and accessible way for a lot of kids. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and it's time for our final break of the podcast. When we come back, Andrew will be giving his advice for aspiring authors. I will prove that I don't know the difference between fiction and nonfiction. I really do, but um, it's not going to sound like I do. So stay tuned. You're listening to the GSMC Book Review Podcast. and I'll The GSMC Life and Happiness Podcast takes you on a journey of exploration. We'll discuss tried and true methods alongside the latest trends of how to best live your life to its fullest and happiest. From psychology to meditation, science to self-help books, the GSMC Life and Happiness Podcast will help you to discover what makes you happy and how you can live life being the best you possible. Download the GSMC Life and Happiness Podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, Google Play, or anywhere you find podcasts. Just type GSMC in the search bar. Welcome back to the GSMC Book Review Podcast and the conclusion of my interview with Andrew Marinus. So out of your journey to coming to publishing historical fiction, um, do you have advice for aspiring authors? Yes, um, in, in historical nonfiction, just to be clear. Um, but my advice is... Sorry about um, that. <laughs> Uh, no problem. <laughs> I blame um, I blame yeah. sheltering in place. It's melting my brain. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you've been doing great. Um, I, I would say, uh, first of all, is just simply to, to do it. Uh, and that's easier said than done. But a lot of times um, people have an idea for a book, and I think they maybe over overthink it um, and imagine all the reasons why they can't do it, you know, or why it won't work. Um, just to do it especially now with self-publishing. That's what I was going to do. After having spent eight years on Strong Inside and um, striking out in every conversation I had with agents and, and publishers, um, I decided if no one was going to publish it, I would self-publish it. Luckily, uh, that um, didn't happen, have to happen. I found Vanderbilt University Press. who published my initial edition of Strong Inside, and then I've been with um, Philomel which is part of Penguin um, for the Young Readers Edition and for Games of Deception and for Singled Out. But I think just having the experience of doing the research and actually writing the book, whether it had ever been published or not, was a uh, really important just life experience for me to get to do that. And um, I think that um, a lot of other people would probably feel the, the same way. Um, you get obsessed with the topic, uh, for better and worse, mostly for the better, you know, but it's there's nothing like um, for me, doing that research, writing the chapters, uh, having that sense of satisfaction and accomplishment um, in and of itself, regardless of, of sales or other people reading the book, 
uh, is a great feeling. And so one piece of advice I would have is just, just do it. Um, if you're interested in writing fiction, the other advice is um, to really devote uh, the proper amount of time to the research and not to be in too big of a hurry to start writing. When I think most people assume that the writing is the the important part or the fun part, uh, that's what you're I meaning. You're writing a book, so of course you would think that, but um, you can't short shrift uh, or sell yourself short on that research. Every single sentence, as I mentioned earlier, is a product of the research, um, not of just using imagination to um, you know imagine what someone might have said or what something might have looked or felt like. You know, it really has to come from from interviews or from research, and so really doing the work. Um, is, is critically important. Those would be my two biggest pieces of advice. Thank you for that. Um, when you then take the time to read, maybe not for research, but for yourself, what are your favorite uh, genres or authors? Okay. Um, well, uh, maybe not too surprising. It's narrative nonfiction uh, is my favorite genre. It's pretty much exclusively, exclusively what I read. Right now I'm reading a great book by Scott Ellsworth, called The World Beneath Their Feet, um, about um, sort of the, the ra worldwide race to be the first to scale the Himalayas. Um, it's the, exactly the type of narrative nonfiction that I love that, um, you know, you can just feel what it was like to be these uh, mountaineers out there in the snow, um, climbing these mountains. And uh, the level of research that Scott has done is incredible. He also wrote a book that I read as research for Games of Deception. Uh, he wrote a book called The Secret Game, which was a book about a basketball game played behind closed doors in front of no fans um, between Duke and a historically black college in North Carolina pre -world, or around World War II era during segregation in the United States. It was a fascinating book. So I love books by Scott. Uh, my father, uh, David Marinus, has written 12 or 13 books. They're all historic um, uh, nonfiction, narrative nonfiction also. So he's been a huge influence in my life. Um, I've always loved uh, Bill Bryson, uh, Eric Larson, um, and then I mentioned Ruda, who's become uh, my mentor here in Nashville. She's a, a favorite uh, fiction author of mine with her uh, historical fiction. Thanks. And how about your kiddos? You said they're six and nine. What are they reading, especially now that they're um, at home? Yeah. <laughs> Well, um, I have a nine-year-old daughter uh, and a six-year-old son, as you mentioned. Every night, my wife has been reading um, Harry Potter uh, to them. I think they're on to the fourth book right now. They've got the illustrated versions of the Harry Potter books, and so they love doing that together. Um, they love a series called The Ballpark Mysteries, which are uh, mysteries for kids that take place in Major League Baseball stadiums. Um, and so as a sports fan, I'm, I'm loving those books, too. Um, my daughter has discovered Beverly Cleary, so she's reading some books from that my wife and I remember from from childhood. And Yay. my son was reading a yeah, <laughs> my son was reading um, a little Star Wars uh, book just this afternoon. So we definitely, while we're all home together, devote um, an hour or more during the afternoon to all sitting around and reading, and then they read uh, at bedtime every night as well. Wonderful. I love that. Um, so I know you have a website. If you can uh, give us the website and tell people where they can find you uh, to interact with you on social media or if you have contact information on your website. Sure. So my website uh, is just my name, andrewmarinus.com, and Marinus is M-A-R-A-N-I-S-S. -S. So you can find me there. There's a contact form there if you'd like to um, reach out. Also, I'm on Twitter all the time. Uh, my Twitter handle is TrueBlue24 uh, without the E's. So it's T-R-U-B-L-U-24 uh, is my Twitter handle. I'm on Instagram, uh, my first initial and last name, so A Marinus on Instagram. And I would encourage anyone to um, get in touch with me any one of those ways. I love interacting with readers. I'd love to hear what people have to say uh, about the books. All right. Thank you for that. So we've talked about a lot. I don't remember if we had, you know, any fabulous conversation last time that we didn't cover this time. But is is there anything you can think of that we didn't no. talk about that you wanted to cover? 
<laughs> no, this has been a great interview, Sarah. I really appreciate it. That's the only thing I wanted to say I, um, is that uh, as an author, and I think I can speak for other authors in saying thank you for doing what you do to allow authors to um, share stories about their books, talk about their books. Um, the opportunities to do that are um, not what they used to be. <laughs> you know, there really aren't book review sections in newspapers the way they used right. to be. Um, and so... Uh, podcasts are, are a wonderful opportunity to do that. I think um, now with people, um, you know, uh, staying at home for the, the safety of, of all of our, of everyone, you know, that it's a, it's a good time to be reading. And I've, I've seen that um, by looking at social media that um, people are, some people are rediscovering the joy of reading. Other people are looking forward to this opportunity to read. Um, and so uh, your podcast is especially relevant right now, but it always is. And uh, um, so thank you for, for doing it. No, oh, thank you for saying that. I really appreciate it. And, yeah, I, uh, people are definitely having to find different ways to entertain themselves right now. So <laughs> That's right. Um, read, people. It's, oh. it's, it's good for you. <laughs> yes, and I will um, say I know that um, I saw that Amazon is uh, limiting non-essential uh, sales and my first advice to people is always to buy a book at an independent local bookstore but if people can't get out of the house to do that i think they may have been turning to amazon but i don't know if you can even order a book off amazon at least in the short term um so i will say in, in my case and in most other authors cases that maybe uh, an ebook would be an option or there's an audio version of, of games of deception now also and so those are oh. alternatives uh if it's difficult to find a uh, hard copy of the book at the, at the present. Right. Yeah. Oh, good. There's an audiobook. I I love audiobooks. Yeah. So that's yeah. awesome. Yeah. And you know, if you if you you can get one of those subscriptions for places like Audio Audible where you pay a, a flat fee and then you can use it like a library, so you can right check out right. audiobooks and then return them and yeah. So cool. Yeah. And then there are a number well, of independent bookstores that are allowing people to. Um, order from the store and they're offering, um, you know, free or reduced shipping at this time. It's an important period uh, to support local bookstores right now where they don't have customers coming into the store. So I would really Absolutely. highly encourage people to support their favorite local bookstore by ordering online right now if they can. Yeah, Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for taking the time, a second time to talk to me about your books. I really <laughs> appreciate it. Uh, my pleasure, Sarah. Thank you again to Andrew for not um, only doing one interview, but but doing two. So, you know, uh, we'll just call that first one a dress rehearsal and move on from there. <laughs> Thank you again to Andrew. Thank you, as always, to you, my listeners. I hope you are having, um, well... I hope that your weekend is as good as it can be, depending on your shelter in place or mandatory lockdown or whatever it is that you are experiencing this weekend. But chances are good you are definitely going to have time to um, read and get lost in that good book. So I hope that is the case for you. And I hope that you will tune in on Tuesday for my next interview. I'll be interviewing Naomi McDougall Jones about her new book, The Wrong Kind of Women. It is about women in the film industry. If you listen to the GSMC movie podcast, you may remember that uh, Tate and I interviewed her last summer, I believe, about um, the movie Bite Me, which she wrote and produced and starred in. And she's a lot of fun. So I'm looking forward to speaking with her about her new book and um, learning more about some pretty major issues that women face in the film industry. So join me for that on Tuesday. And again, in the meantime, have a great weekend and get yourself lost in a good book. Thanks. Tired of searching the vast jungle of podcasts? Now listen close and hear this out. There's a podcast network that covers just about everything that you've been searching. Hey! The Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network is here. Nothing less than a podcast bliss with endless hours of podcast coverage. 
From news, sports, music, fashion, cooking, entertainment, fantasy, football, and so much more. So stop lurking around and go straight out to the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. Guaranteed to fill that podcast itch. Whatever it may be, visit us at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter and download us on iTunes, SoundCloud, and Google Play.